Hello and welcome to tonight's show. <laughs> So at first I was a little bit reluctant, but then I said, all right, well, I'll give it a try. And my very first night, I believe I spent $60. The next morning I was at the bank's door before it opened and I spent another 400. Tell me what it was like, that first blast. It's unlike anything I've ever experienced in my life. It's, it's really, there's not even any words for it to describe it. It's a feeling so intense and so pleasurable that it, I've seen it cause people to spend their last penny. I've seen people spend their rent money, their food money, their, their everything. You mean? Williams, a crack user, called me years ago and asked me to interview well, him. The reason I called you was I felt that the story of crack had to be told in such a way that people would see its effect, its devastating effects on the young people of our communities. My own uh, personal experience with crack has been one of uh, how could I say, uh, <laughs> complete madness. My first nine months in using crack, I spent over $50,000, which included... Uh, say that again, please. My first nine months of involvement with crack, I spent over $50,000. $50,000. $50,000. Where did you get this kind of money from? Well, money, some of it was money that I had saved up. I was currently working as an engineer for a communications firm earning $35,000 a year. I would spend my entire paycheck in one night on crack. So after my pay was gone, I would go to the bank and I started to deplete my savings. Who turned you on to crack? An old uh, girlfriend of mine uh, one evening had invited me to take a ride with her. And we did so. And she bought some crack. And we went back to her place and she began to smoke and asked me if I wanted to try it. So at first I was a little bit reluctant, but then I said, all right, well, I'll give it a try. And my very first night, I believe I spent $60. The next morning I was at the bank's door before it opened and I spent another 400. Tell me what it was like, that first blast. It's unlike anything I've ever experienced in my life. It's, it's really, there's not even any words for it to describe it. It's a feeling so intense and so pleasurable that it, I've seen it cause people to spend their last penny. I've seen people spend their rent money, their food money, their, their everything. You mean from that first time you were gone? Yes. That first hit to me was, was so immense and so unlike anything I'd ever had in my life that I just had to try it again. Had you ever had any involvement with drugs leading up to that? Well, I haven't lived in California for a few years and having been with the Hollywood set, I had tried cocaine on occasion. And crack is something that would cause you to put cocaine down. <laughs> crack is, is it's so, uh, so much mm -hmm. more of a high to it, so much of more of a rush that most people who start using crack usually stop sniffing cocaine. You make a big distinction between crack and cocaine, don't you? So to speak, they're, they're really the same drug, but it's how it's administered. Mm -hmm. Cocaine being sniffed and entering the blood system through the nasal and mucous membranes of the nose, crack and smoke inhaled into the lungs, and therefore in five to 10 seconds causes an immense rush to the head. Mm -hmm. You say you, the Hollywood set, without naming names, uh, what kind of scene did you get into out there? Well, I attended parties in Hollywood where cocaine was passed around in bowls like it would, they were hors d'oeuvres. They were uh, all kinds of different brands of marijuana, reefers, whatever you want to call them, in five pound cigar boxes. And it was uh, just like you were at a, <laughs> a party, but the hors d'oeuvres were drugs. These are actors and actresses? Yes. Names? 
name them. Some name people. Some name people. Some, some top rated shows. And you just dived right into this whole set. <laughs> well, not really. It's kind of eased into it. And once you do, uh, you know, it's it was the the end thing to do. And uh, all of Hollywood was you know was ablaze with it. So if you didn't, you were more of an outcast, I guess, than if you did. And then you came back east. I came back east. Still hadn't heard about crack yet. Still hadn't heard about crack yet. I think Richard Pryor's experience was really opened up a lot of people's eyes to what freebasing was all about. And crack has, is is more, just more so a marketing technique by the <laughs> by the pushers. They package it pretty well these days, and makes it a little bit more appealing. But it's basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so you say that after that first night of sixty bucks, you went back to the bank the next morning. Got the next the morning, I spent another four hundred. And my checking account was consistently overdrawn. I would go to the cash machine and take out my maximum for the day. And I would go to the bank and cash a check against money that the bank store I still had. And my account was constantly overdrawn and it stayed that way. You know, I'm self-employed now uh, because I've been unable to own a job. I recently had a job that uh, was paying me $33,000 a year and it lasted two weeks. My first two weeks. Oh, wait, wait, tell me what happened with this job. Well, I reported to work on Monday. On Tuesday, I made a mistake of stopping at the crack house before I went to work. So I was absent Tuesday. I was absent Wednesday. I figured, well, I better shape up or I won't be here much longer. So Thursday and Friday, I went to work. The following Monday, after a short job I had to do, I said, well, I'll stop for a minute and I'll get one and I'll go back to work. I didn't get back to work till Wednesday. So of course, by Wednesday, it's... <laughs> and Friday was my, that Friday was my last day. $35,000 a year job. Yes. With an expense account? Yes. Car? Yes. And you just blew it. Just like that. How do you feel about that? Well, I have the a portable skill which I could go out tomorrow and get another job if I wanted to. What I feel that? bad about it. Well, I'm into electronics and telecommunications. And I've been in the telecommunications industry about nine years now. So when I'm not working full time for an employer, I work for myself, doing consulting and other you know, jobs, installation. What, what specific skill do you have in telecommunications? What do you do? Well, I was, I'm trained as a, what they call a, a switchman. I oversee electric uh, telephone company, electric offices for switching systems. When you pick up your telephone and make a phone call, it goes to a central office of the phone company. Well, that piece of equipment at the phone company that does all the switching of these telephone calls is which I maintain. Mm -hmm. The person who tries to work and uh, maintain themselves on what a situation such as crack, it's two, two just don't mix, it's like water and oil. Am I to conclude that you're finished with it? No, don't conclude that. <laughs> uh, I probably now, on the average, spend uh, $100 a day. It's about uh, 2 o'clock now. Have you had any today? Not yet. But yet? Not, not yet. But you can believe when I leave here, it's probably be my next stop. Now you're a well-educated man. You have some experience in engineering. Yes. You have earning power, obviously. Right. Why would you be fooling with the stuff you can stand by and see what's happening to, to your own life, Ken? I used to say the same thing. I used to uh, witness people, and even people who were close to me, have their lives destroyed by it. And I used to witness people sit in these places and spend their last penny. And I say to them, how could you do such a thing, you know? But once you have tried it, you become the anchor banker, you understand. <laughs> it really, it's that much of a feeling or a sensation that it causes, it has wrecked lives, careers, broken up homes. It's it's just something you can't really describe. What kind of shape is your life in now? Well, I've, I've been a little bit more fortunate than most that uh, I have a roof over my head. Uh, some people who are into crack usually pay their rent months in advance so they don't get evicted, the smart ones. Because believe me, brother, if whatever money you have in your pocket you walk in there with, you're not gonna walk out with it. So How much do you have on you now? A little over two hundred dollars, and you're going to blow all of that in about an hour and a half. What's the most you've used in a day? 
<clears throat> the most I ever spent was thirteen hundred dollars in six hours. Thirteen hundred dollars. One thousand three hundred dollars in six hours. I can't even describe. I wouldn't. I defy anyone to try and tell me that the most pleasurable thing that they've ever experienced in their life. However, I would never tell anyone to take it. But I'm, once they have, I, I dare them to tell me that it's not the the best feeling they've ever had. You love it, don't you? Well, I don't know if I'd say I'd love it, but... Uh, well, it's, if it's the best feeling you've ever had, you know what most people right. automatically think. Right. It's better than that? Yes. It's better than that. Then you must love it. It's, it's, it's nice. Now, I'm going to come down hard on you. Crack has made you its punk, hasn't it? <laughs> it's got you running. It's got your nose open. Right. And it's your master. Yeah. You admit that, just like that. Sure. Some people won't. I know a lot of people who are undercover crack users or in the closet, but I have no qualms about saying that. Do you know anybody who uses crack and controls crack rather than vice versa? No. Crack is the boss. They will make you crack up. <laughs> crack is the boss. When you take that hit, that second voice that starts talking to you is now in control. You're not yourself anymore. You get up in the morning and that's the first thing you think about? Sometimes I dream about it. In going to these crack houses, you've probably seen some horror stories. You probably have a whole list of them, don't you? <laughs> well, unfortunately I do. And I've seen some people as young as, I would say probably 16, 17 years old. I have been in a crack house on occasion where a young girl came in with a father and she couldn't have been no more than 16, 17 years old. And she says, no, no, daddy, it's my turn to buy. I've been in a crack house where I saw a girl in a Catholic school uniform come in and she couldn't have been no more than 16 or 17 years old. And she bought some cracks and left. And she didn't even go home and change clothes for her. So you didn't even send someone else for her. She came herself. I've seen telephone repairmen, the equipment and all in crack houses. I've seen security guards in crack houses. I've seen transit workers in uniform in crack houses. And I guess it disturbs them not to be there because they are there sitting, smoking away. I've seen people come from New Jersey, go to a crack house, gas tank on empty, and can't even get home. I've seen people go to lunch and never go back to work. I personally have smoked crack in Harlem Hospital in the ladies' room with a girlfriend of mine who used to work there. I've seen women who will come to a crack house with their children and have them wait outside, eight, nine o'clock at night. Children, have the children wait outside? Wait outside. Children four, five, and six years old are standing outside waiting for their mothers, and the mothers are inside smoking on this crack. I've seen a girl one day brought her baby to the crack house, and she was in such a rush to get high that she couldn't wait 20 minutes to cash a check. She pawned her child to the crack man and says, please give me a dime. I'll be back in 20 minutes, hold my baby. Bond her child. Yes, for $10. Bob Williams died not long after the interview I did with him. I'm just going to get right into this. Growing up in the 80s as a kid, I was able to witness people like this gentleman firsthand. The first time I ever touched a dope sack, I was 13 years old. I had no idea what I was doing. I just did what I was instructed to do. Hand over fist. Drop it in their hand. They drop the money. You go on about your business. The money came so fast back then. It was like it would make your head spin. Can you imagine the first time at 13 years old I made $700 in one day, one day. And I can just imagine how much money that my friends were making. When I made that first $700, it was easy to be hooked. It was easy to be intrigued, just like this man that was smoking the product that me and certain people in those days were providing. We had no idea the destruction that this drug was going to cause in all of our communities. I remember people that I used to look up to 
was now starting to come and beg me like I was the adult and they were the child. I remember them selling a TVs, radios, VCRs, watches, jewelry, cars, letting us rent their cars just for a hit. And we as a community are paying a very big price for it now. This man that you see in the video, this is the new generation's parents. This is a lot of the new generation's parents. This is why our generation is the way that it is now. I'm at blame, he's at blame, and everybody that caused this bad situation for our people are to blame. The government is the number one enemy that is the person to blame. The CIA, blame them. Everybody had their hand in the cookie jar. And the only people that suffered from it the most was the people that sold the drugs and the people that smoked the drugs. The people that smoked the drugs, they only got like a little bit of time here and there and a slap on the wrist. But the people that sold the drugs was getting 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in prison. A lot of those guys that was selling drugs in the 80s that got caught are barely even getting out maybe five ten years ago the crack epidemic was something very very painful it broke up a lot of families it broke up a lot of homes it broke up a lot of friendships it it, it just tore everybody apart once upon a time, I lived in a neighborhood where I could be sent by my mother to go knock on the next door neighbor's door and ask them, can I borrow some sugar or can I borrow an egg or can I borrow some butter? And then they would return the favor and ask for something that we didn't have. I mean, that we had and we would, you know, give it to them. It wasn't no disrespect. It was all love in the community. If one of the kids in the community was acting up and that kid's parent wasn't home, that next parent stepped up as the parent and was able to get that child under control and discipline that child and be able to go tell the other parent what they did to that child because that child was acting up. This was the community that I lived in growing up as a child. Now all of a sudden, everything's changed. When the crack epidemic hit, everything changed. I mean like, for instance, back in the day, your mom would write you a note. She would give you that note, you would take it to the corner store, hand it to the man, he'll give you a pack of cigarettes, he'll give you some sweet enough, He'll give you a, a, a bottle of alcohol and you take it right back down to your parents. And then when it was time for him to get paid, your parents would give you some food stamps or give you some cash and you go down and you hand it to the man and that was it and their debt was paid. But after the crack epidemic, everything changed. The people that was in those stores the people that they trusted every day, those people got on crack and they started robbing the man at the store. That killed all of that. People going back and forth, asking each other for everything and borrowing things from one another from neighbor to neighbor, that stopped because they were too busy selling their food stamps for dope or they was giving their food to the drug dealers for dope. And then after that, the parents that used to discipline the kids when the other parent wasn't there, when those parents got on drugs, the drug dealer was telling the parents what to do. Get out my face. Here, take, take, take a hit. 
Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Friends. I watched so many friends become enemies in this game to where once upon a time you had homies that was tight with each other, was cool with each other, down for each other, down to do whatever for each other. But then when the money came into play and the greed came into play, you had homies turning on homies. You had homies killing homies. I remember it being like a war zone in Pasadena growing up as a teenager. And then that's when everybody broke up into cliques. You had your top end, you had your projects, you had your snake pits, you had your east sides, your west sides. This is what the crack game did. And nobody could trust one another. Nobody could be cool with one another. You couldn't just be from the top and then just go think you was gonna hang out in the snake pits. Even though we all claim the same hood, it wasn't gonna happen like that. You couldn't go to the snake pits and set up shop. Just like the people in the snake pits couldn't come up to the tip tops and set up shop. You see how the dynamics have changed? Same thing at the park. When we all were young, we used to go hang out at Jackie Robinson Park. Everybody hung out at Jackie Robinson Park in Pasadena. The DJ would come, turn on the music, get the roller skating, kids playing baseball, basketball, football, everything. It was a whole family affair. Once the crack era came into play, you never seen that no more. Now you started seeing people walking around looking like zombies. Just like that song by Public Enemy, Night of the Living Bass Heads. It was a real dramatic, tragic thing to witness and to see. It has an everlasting effect on your brain for the rest of your life. A lot of the knowledge and the wisdom as kids that we could have received from the adults, we lost that. Because they let a drug get in the way of teaching us and disciplining us and giving us structure. And without that discipline and that structure, we were able to become wild. We ran wild like wild animals. Walking around as a teenager with guns in our hands, money in our pockets, and terrorizing our own neighborhoods. Because we were being something that we knew we weren't meant to be. Yeah, we had money. Yeah, we had cars. Yeah, we had jewelry. All the materialistic things. But we all lack the knowledge. We lack the knowledge because we couldn't no longer get the knowledge. Because the knowledgeable resource was our parents, our cousins, our uncles, our aunties, our grandmothers, our grandfathers. That were hooked on this stuff. They got hooked on it so bad we were just basically out in the world to survive on our own. We had to learn as we went through life. Learn as you grow. That's what we had to do. And it was tough. It was really, really tough. I was real fortunate that my mom, she moved my sisters out of that situation. And as I got older in life and I started seeing that this wasn't what I wanted to do, anymore even though i had to jump in and out of the game here and there just to make it because i knew if anything ever went wrong i knew i can always run back to the streets and i did that quite a few times in my life when the job situations wasn't working or if i was fired or if i was laid off i always knew that i could resort back to the streets and make money anywhere i went because i had the strong hustler mentality to do the things that I had to do 
but that's no excuse for what I had to do, but it's life. And it's just a life that we all had to live back then. A lot of people won't admit it, but so many of us are traumatized about what happened. And we are seeing the nightmare today. The nightmare today of all the crackheads, kids are grown. All the crackheads, grandkids are grown now. And look how they're acting. And everybody's trying to say, oh, you guys can't control this. You guys can't control that. It's too late to control it. My generation dropped the ball because my generation was the cause of the problem. My generation was the cause of the gang violence times two. My generation was the cause of the drug selling times two. All of the killings times two. My generation was the cause of the destruction of our people. And these are the end results. And it seems like it's never going to be repaired. It seems like it's never going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. But for everybody that's still alive, you got to make your wrongs right. You got to let our young men know that this ain't the way to go. You got to let our young women know that this ain't the way to go. We should be tired of being shackled up in jail. We should be tired of being in chains in prison. Because prison is nothing but modern day slavery. We should be tired of getting felonies and all of a sudden now you can't vote. All of a sudden now you can't carry a firearm. We should be tired of these people trying to take away our civil rights. We should be tired of all of this. And everything starts with us. We have to turn it around. We have to make better decisions. We have to fend for ourselves. Cause ain't nobody gonna do for us like we can do for ourselves. We have to learn how to start managing money better. We have to learn how to stop letting all of these high-end influencers influence us into admiring Gucci, admiring Louis Vuitton, admiring jewelry, admiring expensive shoes and expensive cars. We have to start learning how we can buy back our land. We have to learn how we can get our homes that we lost back in the day. We have to get back to educating ourselves. We have to start thinking smarter and quit working harder. But that's my conclusion to this video. I hope that you liked this video and like, share and comment on this video. Hit the notification bell and that'll let you know when a new video that I make is posted. This is your host with the most big bang and I'm up out of here. Peace. Double down.